Hi, everyone, and welcome to the National Book Festival. My name is Sherry Werb from the Library of Congress, and I'm here today with Chelsea Clinton, whose featured book at the festival is She Persisted in Sports, American Olympians Who Changed the Game. If you'd like to see Chelsea Clinton's presentation at the festival, please log in to nationalbookfestival.com. Let's begin the conversation now. I see we have some uh, questions already. So uh, Chelsea, Marie A asks, are you working on another book now? I, I am uh, working on a couple of book projects um, and I can't talk about them yet, but I'm really excited to share them when I can. Although I can uh, talk about something else I am uh, really excited about that is book related, uh, which is that next year in 2021, uh, we are going to be releasing chapter books um, featuring all of the uh, 13 women who were in the first She Persisted um, picture book. And I'm just so grateful to all of the amazing uh, women authors who have uh, lent their talents to help bring uh, Helen Keller and Oprah Winfrey and Florence Wilson Joyner and Nellie Bly and all of the women um, that I write about in the first She Persisted uh, kind of in, into the world in, in chapter book form. Great. Um, those of you who are watching, please feel free to put comments or uh, questions in the chat. Um, I'm curious to know uh, who or what inspired you to become a professional writer? I've always loved to write, and I'm so thankful to the teachers that I had as a kid who expected me uh, to write. And I think through that expectation that kind of everyone can be a writer, um, that every child at least should try uh, to be a writer, um, I really did discover this this love of writing. And um, I really uh, became a uh, a children's book author. I'd written um, kind of academic uh, works and I'd written uh, for um, kind of older, uh, older readers in the kids category, so you know, preteens, teenagers. Um, I really though became a, a children's book writer when I, I became a mom and started uh, reading a lot of children's books and um, kind of couldn't find some of the types of books that I really wanted to um, read with my kids, uh, both my my daughter and at the time I only had uh, one son. So kind of that uh, compelled me into, into this space and I'm just uh, so thankful uh, that my children brought uh, children's literature into my life and that it is now such a big part of, of what I do. Well, we're thankful too that you're writing. Um, Sam Eddington has a question for you. Uh, have you considered writing fiction? Uh, yes, um, for about, uh, two years maybe now. I, every once in a while I pick up this fiction idea that I've had and I've, I have an outline um, and I've kind of fleshed out some of the main characters and I've even talked to my editor about the idea. Um, and I'm sure that many people can uh, empathize with this. This was sort of one of like, the things I thought I might get done in quarantine, but uh, I spent all of my time like being a mom and working from home in quarantine for all of the things I'd already committed to do. So um, it's still there, like in the back of my head, kind of rattling around. Um, so I hope, uh, I hope that I will find the time um, to kind of try to wrestle that into existence. So stay tuned. I don't know when, but hopefully at some point. Okay. Well, Emily Colucci asks, what was your favorite book or story growing up? And what is one or two titles in particular, which you and your children love to read together? Oh my gosh, such fun questions. So oh, I'll start with um, kind of the the books that I, I loved growing up that my, my kids are reading right now that they love. I loved this book, Once Upon a Rainbow, um, which is about a little girl who kind of adventures through every color of the rainbow. Um, and I just thought it was the most kind of magical and wonderful read as a child. My parents saved that book and um, kind of gave it to my kids, to their grandkids, and uh, my children find it as as captivating um, 
as I did. Uh, similarly, another book that I love is the case called The Wizard's Daughter that they all, that my parents also gave my kids that they love. Um, I also love the George and Martha stories, which my kids are loving. I've loved Amelia Bedelia, which my kids are <laughs> loving. Um, and then, you know, they brought all sorts of books into my life that I didn't have as a kid. We are huge Mo Willems fans in our family. And we love Elephant and Piggy. And we love The Pigeon. Um, we also love uh, his book about Edwina, the dinosaur who didn't uh, I believe she was extinct. Um, we love the Keith Nigley book, uh, Mary Wears What She Wants, about uh, the amazing Mary Edwards Walker, who helped um, kind of normalize the wearing of pants for women in our country and also um, was a battlefield surgeon during the Civil War and um, is the only woman to have ever received the Congressional Medal of Honor in our country's history, um, which is, I think, a shocking anecdote, um, extraordinary for her, but shocking that there haven't been other women kind of deemed uh, worthy of the honor. Um, and so, yes, it's so fun to discover um, books with my kids. My son, admittedly, also at the moment is really into superheroes. So um, we read a lot of like the Marvel five minute superhero stories um, with like acting out that you know, he uses, I don't know, whichever character we're reading about at the moment, Iron Man or Black Panther. Kind of whichever has caught his imagination like that evening. Um, we read a lot, not surprisingly, in our family. And thankfully, they, li they like to read my books too. Probably not among their favorite, um, but they're up there. Well, maybe you and your kids would want to watch Mo Willems, who's going to be live answering questions at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. And uh, that'll be a fun conversation as well. Um, we have a question from Hannah Soltis, who happens to be a librarian at the Library of Congress, and she is curious to know if you could talk about your research process for the topics often written for adults as you distill those into children's books. Oh my gosh, that is uh, such a great question. I don't, I don't know if I've ever really been asked that question, uh, so I'm thrilled to be able to talk about this here. So I do a lot of research. I mean, I know there are like three or four sentences on these pages, but I do a lot of research to get to those three or four sentences. So I read um, biographies if there are like institutions or organizations that steward these women's kind of legacies or, or work. Um, I reach out to them. Um, I kind of obviously read their materials. Um, and I probably write about two pages for each woman first, and then that um, kind of gets winnowed, distilled, narrowed, whatever the right verbs are, down to like one page, and then that gets down to like one paragraph. And it's actually the hardest to then take kind of, you know, that one or two paragraphs and get that down to three or four um, sentences. So, and I, and I obviously, if they've written autobiographies, I read those too. But thank you for asking that. Guto Galve Galveo, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly. Are you considering to write about children's environmental health? So I've, I've written about um, kind of children's environmental health. If you mean um, if you mean the environment at, at home or in the communities where they're living or kind of our, our global environment and climate change um, in a couple of different uh, ways, but most recently in a book called Start Now, which I wrote for um, kind of, you know, el elementary aged kids, say like six to nine, six to 10 year olds about some of the issues that I had heard um, kind of from kids, from my nieces and nephews, from their friends, from kids that I had interacted with on uh, other book tours uh, and in other um, foras that, uh, Kind of were really on their on their mind. So I, I write about um, bullying. Um, sadly, I have heard about bullying all over the country, um, and I write about the environment, uh, and I write about endangered species um, and kind of health and and nutrition and kind of um, just tackle questions that I'd heard kind of uh, from kids themselves, and also highlight some of the kids specifically in in that age group, kind of who are you know seven, eight, nine, trying to save their local frogs or stop the idling of cars in their schools, um, kind of raise awareness about uh, solar energy um, and more. So yes, I, I have written about that and hope I'll have the chance to write more about it. Thank you for doing that. Uh, we have a number of questions from Wendy Weldon. 
but I'm going to ask, uh, would you consider collaborating on a book with another author or your parents? So I've written a couple of books now with my mom um, and absolutely would consider you know, collaborating with either of my parents or, or other authors. Um, I very much consider um, the She Persisted books to be collaborations with the, with the illustrator, with the extraordinary Alexander Boyer, who I could not imagine um, these books without her uh, incredible talents and um, just have so loved working with her now over the last, goodness, three year, three and a half years. Um, and I knew of her work um, because we love the Tallulah Ballerina series, which Alexandra illustrates. I just thought it had the right mix of kind of being earnest and whimsical, of being kind of serious and yet also like approachable and accessible. And that's really what I uh, wanted and hoped for with the She Persisted series. Uh, so yes, always open um, to, uh, to collaborations and um, very much have lived experience of how um, how important it is to find to find the right collaborator um, for whatever um, we may be writing or kind of thinking about writing. Great. Um, well, we have a question from a third grade teacher, I believe, Doreen Michael. Uh, what was your favorite chapter book growing up? My third graders are curious to know. Oh, my, I, A Wrinkle in Time, like unquestionably. I loved A Wrinkle in Time. Um, and think about Meg all the time, still today, like, I don't know, 30 years later. Um, so yeah, that was my favorite book. I mean, I loved, I have always loved to read, so I love lots of chapter books, but if I, if I just get to pick one, that is absolutely the one that I have to pick. So third graders, try that one, Wrinkle in Time. Uh, we have a question from Leanne Gelski. What book is on your nightstand right now? Ooh. Uh, there are a lot of books on my nightstand right now. Um, I mean, the honest answer is probably lots of my kids' books are on my nightstand because um, my son Aiden had a nightmare last night and we crawled into bed very early this morning or late at night um, and brought a whole stack of um, books with him. So the probably like most honest real-time answer is like those are what you would see first on my Bookstand, um, I have uh, uh, Glennon Doyle's most recent book on my bookstand, which I have not started yet. Um, I have uh, Louise Penny's most recent book on my bookstand, which I also have not started yet. Um, I have uh, found myself mainly reading, um, this is kind of my other great passion in life uh, and commitment in life to global health. I spend uh, most of my time reading about COVID these days and reading articles in The Lancet or the British Medical Journal or Kind of reporting from around the world. So um, my fiction reading has gotten kind of scrunched and my nonfiction reading has also gotten scrunched if it doesn't um, relate to COVID candidly. And, and I've reread some of like the great global health books that I'd read before. Like I reread Lori Garrett's The Coming Plague um, and I reread a couple of the books about the um, 1918 flu uh, pandemic. So uh, even like the books I'm reading are, are kind of related to, to that at the moment. Vivian Whipple has uh, a nice question. Would you ever write a book with your daughter? Ooh. Yeah, yes. If she wanted to write a book, I would be honored and thrilled to write a book with her or with my sons. I mean, Jasper just turned one, so he's probably not. I mean, he's just trying to like learn words right now. He's very chatty, um, but we don't quite know what he's saying yet. Uh, I would love to um, write a book with my with my children. My daughter does create lots of stories. She is um, obsessed with sharks. She loves sharks. She doesn't understand why so many people are scared of sharks when most sharks are harmless and sharks are, as she will tell you, um, so important to the kind of health and balance of the oceans. Um, and so she's constantly making up stories where sharks like are the are the are the good guys in the story and the heroes of the story and like rescuing i don't know the goldfish or whatever needs to be rescued in her story so she's already very creative and i am super excited to kind of learn from her and with her and would love to collaborate with her if that's what she wanted to do we will stay tuned on that one 
Emily Hansen uh, wonders, how do you make sure to represent people of all races and backgrounds? Is this important to you and why? Uh, it's hugely important to me. Um, I think that uh, representation matters. Certainly representation is not sufficient um, to you know, uh, obliterate uh, you know, centuries of uh, structural and systemic racism in our country. Um, and yet, we know we're not going to be able to do that if we don't have representation. You know, if we don't kind of um, enable kids to see themselves uh, in in books, I think you know so often it is through picture books um, where children, for the first time, you know, outside of their outside of their families, you know, are are told effectively like what is what is possible or not for them, what is expected or not, kind of what will they be kind of believed in for their Kind of potential in their aspirations, their dreams, or not. Um, so representation is hugely um, important to me, and I'm really um, kind of always open to continued like feedback and criticism and suggestions for um, what more I can be doing and how I can um, help you know channel attention that might be paid to me or my books kind of on to kind of more diverse people kind of who are in this case yes persisting um but also very much like proving um what is possible because i i think about kind of something that both uh, two women that i really admire um sally ride and and marianne wright edelman um who is the founder of the children's defense fund both um said in, in different ways um but it, it's hard to imagine what you can't see. Um, so I think we need to help kids see themselves in as many ways as possible uh, so that they can imagine themselves to be everything. That's a, uh, a great transition to this next question from Andrea Sanzari. Um, would you ever consider writing a book on what it was like to grow up in the White House as a child? Maybe. I mean, I, I would consider it. It's not something I've really thought about doing um, yet, but maybe at some point. Um, Crystal Beard asks, with few funds to afford new books, I use my public library extensively. How do you partner with libraries and reading initiatives to make sure that children have access to all books? So I think that's such a crucial question. I'm so thankful um, to to Penguin and and to Philomel, um, my imprint at Penguin, for their uh, commitment to this. And we've partnered together and have helped uh, donate uh, tens of thousands. I mean, now actually hundreds of thousands of books, um, including most recently um, more than twenty five thousand books um, to uh, to Little Rock, which is a place uh, close to my heart, um, where I born and spent the first 12 years of my life um, to help distribute to families during COVID uh, at uh, food distribution sites. Um, we've done a lot of work with uh, the National Diaper Bank Network, including like right here in New York, uh, Hope Line, which is uh, the major diaper bank uh, in the Bronx, um, but also have worked with some of the national network uh, across the country. Um, and have, I think, uh, I think distributed more than 200,000 books now kind of through, through the partnership with Penguin and then um, kind of through our work with something called Too Small to Fail um, have distributed more than a million books um, across the country through um, working uh, with uh, food banks and food pantries um, but also pediatricians offices um, so that pediatricians can actually like prescribe books and then have books uh, to give to families um, and we've done that work uh, largely with Scholastic um, but also with other partners. So I fundamentally believe it's important and try to do what I can both kind of as an, as an author um, and an advocate to help uh, more kids get more books. Thank you for doing that. Um, what I have another question here from Ryan Morales. What's it like to have Hillary Clinton as a mother? Well, I don't know what it's like to not have her as a mom. I, mean, I, don't, I don't mean to be flippant. I just like, she's my mom. Like, she's always been my mom. She's great as a mom. Um, and I've always known that um, that was the most important part of her life was, was to be my mom. So I've always been incredibly proud of her um, 
and all that she's done, uh, and yet also, um, first and foremost, thought of her as my mom. Okay, here's a question from Katie Klenkel. Uh, speaking of, well, just thinking about COVID, um, and you have young children, how are you and your family navigating the remote school situation? Are they remote learning? And if they are, do they enjoy it? Um, well, I will say at the, at the beginning, um, in March, uh, we, Charlotte adapted like pretty quickly. Um, and has really been able to, I think, um, clearly like she misses life pre-COVID. Um, I think she's really been able to have uh, meaningful like interactions through a screen um, with her teachers um, and also with her friends. I mean, she has like Zoom play dates and FaceTime play dates and they, you know, will like pick a craft to work on together. Um, whether they're like making masks or they're drawing something. She even had like one play date where like we like were baking. Uh, I think we were making like granola bars. And, like, her friends were making granola. Everybody was making granola bars like one Saturday. Um, it's It's been harder, I think, for Aiden, who's younger, to feel that same level of, um, of, of connection. Um, they're both in kind of hybrid models now, which I'm grateful for. Um, and yet you know, I'm really aware of um, like of my son Jasper, who's a year old, who's now spent uh, half it, more than half his life like in uh, quarantine or shelter in place, kind of staying at home, staying separate and um, safe. Uh, and obviously he can't build like baby friendships on a screen. <laughs> so you know, he's not having like virtual baby play dates. Um, and I'm so thankful that his big brother and his big sister like love him so much and spend a lot of time with him and play with him and kind of read with him and talk to him and engage with him. Um, but I I'm aware that he like has no friends to I mean he's not walking to like walk and run around with or to learn how to navigate like who gets to chew on the board book or the magnet tile. Um, so I don't. I don't know what more to do than just kind of continue to like ensure that he knows he's, he's loved and to just tell him like, at some point you're, you're going to have baby friends. Like you will have them at some point when it's safe. I'm sure so many people watching feel very similarly to you really tough times. Um, I, I love this question from Gail Ham. Uh, your mother said she gave you her Nancy Drew books. How are you influenced by Nancy Drew's character? Will you read them to your daughter and perhaps your sons? Oh my gosh, I absolutely will read them uh, to my daughter and and to my sons. Um, and I love Nancy Drew. I mean, I, I think I knew, like even when I was reading them as a kid, first with my mom and then on my own, like that it was totally improbable this 16-year-old girl um, would be like off on her own, like gallivanting around solving mysteries um like not really in school or working who kind of her father checked in like sometimes i mean i it i, I know that i i know that even at the time it felt kind of um uh, unreal uh, and yet even though i knew all of that just her kind of doggedness her belief that she could like tackle any problem and solve any mystery was incredibly inspiring to me. And um, I'm also thankful that my, because when my mom read the stories, um, and so then like had the books that my grandmother um, saved and that like she gave to my mom and like I will give to my children at some point, that they are from the era before like Nancy Drew got this um, kind of feminine edit, like in the early sixties where, you know, she's, started wearing skirts instead of pants or trousers. Um, and like the, the language around her became like a little softer. The adjectives were shifted to be a little more feminine um, or what was perceived to be feminine at the time. So um, I'm thankful that we have like the, like the original versions before that happened. Although now, as I'm sure, I mean, if you know, there's been an effort to like kind of undo those edits and, and return the text. 
to what was originally written and intended. So Laura, Sylvia has a follow-up question there um, on Nancy Drew. How do you deal with some of uh, Nancy Drew's problematic racial language and attitudes? Or would you if you were reading yeah. her? Well, you have to deal with it. I mean, I, I think that um, when I read the books with my kids, like we will talk about that. You have to talk about that. You have to, I mean, I don't think um, simply because something was acceptable 60, 70 years ago, um, somehow makes it like less terrible or more okay. I've never um, bought into that framework, whether we're talking about Thomas Jefferson or Nancy Drew. Um, so I think I think you just, you deal with it and you talk about it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be asking you the last question. Um, so Rachel Jameson asks, what do you do, what do you enjoy doing when you are able to squeeze out a few minutes of free time? Uh, run. I, if I have like 20 minutes, 25 minutes probably, I'll go for like a 20 minute run. Well, hope you have time for that today. And um, really- I have time for that today, but you know, tomorrow, tomorrow. Excellent. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time uh, to spend the more uh, spend some time with us today, and we hope you have a really really good day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Stay safe, everyone.